That's better. Hello! Who's excited? Hi, Bria. How's everybody doing midweek? First full week back to work for a lot of people. Has anybody listened to Irish yet? It's fantastic. Not yet. It's very good. And um, it does, the title does confuse some people. There is not an Irish accent used in this audiobook, but there is a Boston accent, which we'll talk about that a little bit. And maybe you'll get to hear it a little bit. <laughs> Aural Romance Audiobook Club. That is the audiobook club that I started with two friends. Uh, it meets over on FB, but we have handles on all social media. But, oh, thank you. But you guys should come join us. Lots of audiobook recs, and we do giveaways all the time. And we have uh, monthly picks that you can listen to or not listen to but we try to mix it up and always use different authors, different narrators. There's a lot of people here already. Hi, Kelly. Oh, thank you so much. I had to wear my green shirt because of Irish. It's the only green thing I own. <laughs> but I thought I needed to, uh, to wear it for this. Okay, you steamy romance reads. Oh, it's Rachel. I wasn't sure if it was Rachel or Jessica. I'm so thirsty. Thank you. I love my pink too. It kind of, sometimes with these lives, they'll do uh, random filters. Um, so it actually looks slightly darker right now than it normally does. It's usually a little more purpley looking in real life. <laughs> but not with whatever's happening with the screen. It might just be the lighting. <gasps> Taylor! Hi. Taylor, am I gonna get to meet you in real life one day? I hope so. <gasps> There's Brittany. There we go. I don't know if I did it right. <laughs> Do you need a refresh on I, Whiskey Lies and Loving Whiskey before listening to Irish? Last time. There we go. My volume was turned way down. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Well, you know, I'm doing good. Doing so we good. had our first question of, do you, does Chris need a refresh on Whiskey Lies and Loving Whiskey before listening to Irish? Certainly, if you have read Whiskey Lies and Loving Whiskey, I think that you're in a good spot. Um, but there's like, I, th I think that the fun thing about Irish is like the characters when you see them. I don't think it's so much that you need to like remember everything about the storyline, if that makes sense. Right. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Revenge Era. Oh, Revenge Era was so good. Oh, Dirty Truths is great too. Yeah, I like the way that you did the duets because I feel like the Whiskey Lies duet is kind of its own thing. The Extra Dirty could be its own thing. There are characters that are mentioned back and forth. And then you have Irish. But as long as you stick together with this duet, this duet, or Irish, then you can go back and listen to whichever ones you want to. Yes, I think they can totally be all read out of order as long as you read in order of duets. I agree with that. And Irish can completely stand alone. A lot of like people that read it in October who didn't wait for the audio to come out because they didn't understand how amazing the audio would be um, and they just wanted to read it. A lot of those people with um, uh, had not read it. So they had already, they were new to the world, if, if you will. 
I like how you have Irish behind you, by the way. I do. See that? <laughs> we don't have very many physical copy books, but I love I it. Wearing my green shirt for the occasion. I well. know you are like already. Yeah. Well, hello, Mr. Arden. Hi. Am I here? <laughs> you are. Joe in the house. <laughs> um. Why? Does everybody else see? I see two. I see a red and blue dot circling over my head right now. Is that? That's not happening anywhere else. Okay. No, we don't see it. <laughs> okay. A red, a red and blue dot. That is odd. Like a, it's like it's like a TikTok loading thing. But hey, if I'm here, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry about it. I think you're good. <laughs> I love it. Well, hello to you both. You you look wonderful. I'm thrilled to be here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to Happy you. Year. Has it has it been a busy week for you guys getting back into the swing of things after all the holidays? Uh, every week is a busy week for me, which I say with great pride and joy, actually. So, yes, you yes. have been a very, very busy man the last couple of months, Joe. Um, I would argue that I've been a busy boy for the last couple of years, actually, but uh... <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Um, I listen, I, you know, I, it comes down to one thing and one thing only every time. And it's that I fucking love what I'm doing. And I, um, I just, you can't drag me away from this stuff because I just think it's fucking incredible. So, um, yeah, look at all, I mean, and look at the community that you're helping grow and be a part of here, Tiffany. Like I'm seeing so many folks that were just authors influencers narrators look at everybody just showing up and saying hey like what a what a beautiful part of the fucking world that we all get to share it is fascinating sarah hi sarah she's supposed to be at work tonight she must be uh sneaking around in the back <laughs> sarah was listening to audiobooks while she was at work today <laughs> she was trying to finish irish <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um when you are doing something that you really, really love, it's so easy to just completely immerse yourself in it and you end up working what feels like 24 seven, but you have got to have a work life balance. Hey, Justin, he's bringing <laughs> me my drink. Do you guys have drinks tonight? Well I done. Do. I what do. I do. I sadly only have red wine, but I did put it in my little James whiskey cup, which you can't see because of how dark it is, but I did that. And then I put my water in my Irish cup. So I'm like fully branded apparently today. It's mine. Justin made me a little cocktail. What do you have there? There's a, are there black, are there blackberries in there? There's cherries, even old fashioned. These are, um, these are the Luxardo cherries. Okay. Hey, is this your lab with Teddy tonight? <laughs> wow. Justin's got jokes. <laughs> what jokes? Oh, this yeah. is Joe tonight. It's Joe. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Uh, most people think that uh, I'm responsible for all of Teddy's best work, so. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Joe, I actually knew it was you tonight. Uh, <laughs> but I, I will say, God's honest truth um i love tiffany and support her 100 uh everything she does i think is fantastic but she will say who is this and it's a 50 50 toss up if i get it right or not it, it is it, i typically get it wrong and typically. i i should just start not trusting my gut and just say the opposite but um <laughs> but cheers to you guys tonight cheers i've got uh cheers, I'm, drinking, I'm drinking blade and bow neat uh so uh Cheers. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. Do you hear a lot of what she listens to? Because a lot of the content that Tiffany shares, she's got headphones in or she talks about the fact that she's listening. She has, she has he headphones in during the day at night. Um, when we're getting ready for bed, I get mm -hmm. to get to listen in uh, on on some scenes and Just listens in a little snippets. I, I hear little snippets. A lot of times I get sucked in. I'm like, what's going to happen? So uh, it's it's really interesting. But um, he won't actually listen to a book with me. No, I haven't I haven't listened to a book with her yet. Mm 
I am uh, sipping on Old Forester single barrel barrel strength neat tonight, Joe. So uh, cheers on the on the neat pours. Cheers. <laughs> the, so barrel barrel strength seems to be having a, a bit of a moment right now, and I gotta say, like, I don't know if it's because I drink a lot of bourbon or what, but like. Barrel strength is a dangerous place for me to to spend my evening. I can tell you that because the you, you can only have one or two. Yeah, and I don't like to only have one or two. <laughs> so, uh, hey, Tiff, yeah. is this the part where you wanted me to take my shirt off and flex for everybody? No, I'm just doing my best to embarrass her since I'm here. She she invited we'll get, me. And we'll get bananas. She she doesn't off. she doesn't know what she's getting into. Hey, y'all have All fun right. tonight. Love Bye. you. Thank you, Justin. Cheers. <laughs> he said this had about 13 ingredients in it. Oh, right. wow. 13 ingredients. It's fancy. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Everybody's talking about bourbon in the comments. <laughs> That's not true. Some of them want um, him to be the next cover model. Oh, okay. We're thinking uh, we need a male model for Daddy Ford, so... If you want to hook that up <laughs> i mean he's close daddy ford is what well you can't call him daddy 47 yeah, justin's yeah. 42 so there you go. we're not too far off from that spot <laughs> i remember when i thought people in their 40s were old yeah coming call upon it yeah. coming upon it oh. all right well let's let's talk about these books let's talk about irish Let's talk about uh, this Boston accent, Joe. I think it's uh, I think it's important to start any discussion about the book called Irish uh, with a clear indication that we are operating in a uh, Southie Boston landscape, which of course has a lot of roots in Irish, uh, but it's not the same accent. It's uh, it's a uh, it's a bit of a misnomer for people that expect to hear a certain thing when they listen to my books. But the good news is there is still a thick, consistent accent for this one. So it's not uh, it's maybe not the the titular accent, but it is one of my favorites. So um, yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean I uh, I've actually fallen in love with the with the South Boston accents, uh, and I really kind of connect with it personally, even though I have no. Uh, geographic ties to Beantown at all, but. Have you uh, ever visited? I have. Uh, I went once, uh, I went once when I was in, in college with some friends and we had a, just a wonderful weekend. And then uh, I went back a couple of years ago and I went to Fenway and uh, I gotta say, as a, as a born Dodgers fan, that it hurts me to say it on some level, but game recognized game and, um, Boston baseball fans, they love the game. They love the team. Um, they really turn their city out. I went to just some like random regular season game, like late in the season. I sat in one of those original seats. I did all this research about where I was going to sit because Fenway has these, um, the second deck is like supported by these huge pillars. So if you're sitting on the first deck, there's sections where you're like straight up just staring at a pole. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes, there is. Yes. It is. They're very cheap seats though. So, the, but there's websites, there's a website that you can go to with this like eight bit graphics and it tells you what you can and cannot see from every single seat in Fenway. And yeah. so I had a, I had a blast doing all this research and then like they shut down the area around the stadium two hours before the game. There were clowns, jazz musicians, beer competition. It was a, and again, this was just like a random Wednesday game. And I was like, man, I'm here for this. This is great. That would be really fun. Yeah. It's always like that. That's, that's the fun part about that stadium. It's a fun spot. Yeah. And I, I think, I don't know if I, uh, the first time I went, so I, there's in, in Boston, there's the, uh, What's it called? Is it called the Freedom Trail? Um, what? There's, yes. Like, yes. There's there's literally like red paint in a line through the yeah. city and you can walk the yes. like revolutionary history of Boston. I um so badly. And I was standing outside of the bell tower where Paul Revere famously lit candles and had put them up in the thing. And this guy, where you know, you're in you're in Boston, like you're just in the city. And this guy walks by um, 
with a friend of his and he points to some building and he says, uh, my daughter used to take a theater class there. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's the most Boston sentence I have ever heard. My daughter used to take a theater class there. And, uh, so that one has, that one has stuck with me and, uh, yeah. And now, you know, and now I get to bring some of that to life, uh, in this in this series and that's been really special and super fun so I, you did a fantastic job with the accent too because sometimes that accent can sound very very strong but i feel like you did a good job in the in the book irish of not putting it on too thick especially in the narration part and it's interesting because you were actually the one that taught me this sometimes i'll have people say things like oh you know i was listening to that book and they were kind of slipping in and out of their accents but what they're hearing is the difference between the dialogue and the narration and how the accent will come out stronger in the dialogue and not as much in the narration uh i think that because of how intimate the listening experience can be um and you're not doing these things for a minute at a time you're you're in somebody's ears for hours and hours and so i think you need to be mindful of the best way to keep the listener engaged and allow them to have the room to navigate the words the way the author kind of penned them while you are simultaneously breathing life into the characters that are a part of that story and with certain accents uh, um the harder and heavier you go the more working class uh the more sort of fourth or fifth generational you end up uh it can be tricky i mean i've got uh I've got family members, like there's certain people I'm like, listen, I can't understand you, like, or I can't, you know, <laughs> and so I think then that's where you sort of need to find the balance between breathing some creative energy and breathing some creative license into the storytelling with uh, the sort of authentic approach to where those characters come from. And what's interesting about this one in particular is, um, Frank was kind of, well, Frank was a, a character before Frank got his own story. Mm -hmm. So, um, mercifully, Brittany was kind enough to indicate to me as I started in the Boston Billionaires universe that Frank may indeed at some point get his HEA, which was really great information to have because sometimes if you have a minor character in a story, like a minor character is a great place to really fucking lean into access, really like, are we trying to fucking set a scene here? Am I the fucking driver? Am I the guy in the fucking corner? Like, am I your fucking guy that's in like four scenes and like hit and miss and like a little bit of this? Like, hey, we're in fucking Boston and I'm the character in this fucking story that's gonna make you fucking remember. <laughs> but you don't yes. want that guy. You don't want that guy <laughs> falling in love over the course of nine hours. I mean, yeah. I want him. I want him to. But you want to maybe listen to a, a light, a lighter, softer <laughs> version of him. Mm -hmm. Um, that would be hard to listen to for nine hours. <laughs> I actually think, and what it's so funny is, I don't even know when I, I, because I never wrote Frank with an accent in the first book. I, to be honest with you, I didn't know Frank's story until I heard Whiskey Lies audio and you gave him an accent. So I've got to be honest, I think you had a little bit to do with that. Oh um because yes he was from boston so obviously i mean for me because i live up here um i just kind of assume that that's around there and i had said to joe when he said for cash does he have a boston accent and i was like no he's got like money and he goes back and forth between nashville so i don't think he'd have a deep you know southie accent um and he's like well what about frank and i was like sure um i hadn't really thought about it to be honest with you like in the writing um so to be fair, part of his story really came from the fact that you created this character with that voice in Whiskey Lies, which is I love that. How just how I mean that's how the writing process works. Random things, you know, trigger things. Um, um I don't I I don't want to make too fine a point of it, but I want to take a moment to say how fucking cool I think that is. Um how powerful the collaborative experience has become 
for, and I frankly, I think that this is a uniquely indie author phenomenon, and he maybe even particularly uh, rooted in the romance space right now. Um, but just this sense that as you're building your world, something could happen in the audio telling of a story that, by the way, you already wrote. Like, I didn't create that character that he, Frank's yours. Frank's a part of your imagination. You gave me as a fellow artist and as a creative collaborator, you gave me some room to um, breathe my own idea of what the sort of vocal life and the emotional depth of his heart may be. But um, the idea that something that we could create together in this first book would add kindling to and maybe dimension to what that character ends up looking like in a book. I mean, now just seeing the cover and his nickname on the title of a book, like, I don't know, that's really, that's powerful. That's next level something like that level of collaboration and community is, um, it's pretty unique. I can't, I can't think of a parallel, um, frankly. I mean, you know what I guess would be a close parallel? It's like, um, you know, those characters on TV shows, uh, if you've ever heard this story where somebody's like, yeah, um, we wrote, you know, Jimmy in for three episodes and the writers and the staff and the stars loved him so much. We wrote him into the next three seasons of the show. Like, yeah, 1000%. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. That's, I think that's just really cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> it's true. Um, I mean, the same thing happened I, 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 with Extra Dirty and Dirty Truths when we were talking about um, having you come on to that project. And then I was like, there's this scene in it and it's going to involve Frank. And so maybe we want to get the person who's doing that um, voice to be the voice of the next book. And then suddenly we're casting the next book without me having written it. So I was fortunate enough with Irish to know that it was going to be you and Maxine writing, reading it before I wrote it. So I, I that highly influenced how I wrote the book. Um, just knowing how that was, you know, that was going to work. So it's, it's been a fun, yeah, it's been a very fun project in that way, knowing, you know, that the narration was going to be so involved in it. Um, and I, you know, it, that's not a foregone conclusion. Like that's not a guarantee. And I, I don't take a minute of those connections for granted. Um, when an author tells me that they're writing with my voice in mind or that they're fleshing out characters, um, that I had voiced previously and that all of a sudden the way that character talks and their dialogue flows sort of easier than it had before. Um, that's transcendent to me. I, I really, I don't think I can overstate how incredible I think that is. Um, and you know, I still collaborate with authors, some of whom I will say I'm finding this is the case less and less. Um, but I still work with authors that are like, I can't listen to my own words, or I've never listened to my own words. Um, yeah. That's not the case for you, Brittany. I take it you are. No, no. I was listening because today when Sarah was yelling at me, I'm, I don't know if you saw her video yelling about a certain scene in Irish. Um, and she's done that throughout as she's been reading it. And she's been, I mean, listening. And she's been listening to that and reading Mother Faker at the same time. And so I've been getting the I'm going to kill you and also I love you so much um, messages from her at the same time. But so because she was listening to it today, I start, I went back and started listening to some of the scenes. And then, of course, like I'm supposed to be writing today and instead I'm sitting here listening to you and Maxine do the do this amazing scene. And I'm sitting here and I'm crying and I'm like, I do, this is so beautiful. It doesn't I don't attribute it even to my words. Like when you hear it, it doesn't sound like something that I wrote down. It just sounds like this beautiful scene that you're witnessing, um, which is just incredible. So, no, I love listening to it. Um, it I certainly do not. Uh, I don't avoid it. That's for sure. 
Yeah, and, and Joe was in the unique situation with all five of these books in this universe. He was the male narrator for all three of the main male characters and then had the opportunity to work with three amazing co-narrators, Lucy Rivers on Whiskey Lies and Loving Whiskey, and then we had Stella Bloom for uh, Dirty Truths, Extra Dirty, and then Maxine Mitchell on Irish. Yeah. Uh, I think it's nice to have an anchor on a series um, when it's going to audio because um, it allows for a little more three dimensionality in the in the character arc and sort of emotional world building. Because um, here's just a fact of the business. Um, if I'm working on one title inside of a universe, there's there's no earthly way that I have the time to read the other five books in a series. Yep. Right. But the characters appear throughout those stories. And so, and authors are writing with an eye toward foreshadowing, with an eye toward emotional recall. Um, so you might take something like, and this is a, a fictional example, but you could see where something like, um, you know, let's say Cash James had this sort of reveal in book one where he talks about this emotionally connective experience he has with his father. And now we're four books later and they're at a hockey game, you know, and like Brittany may not even mention it, but if you played, if you if you read Cash in book one and you're invested in the story, then you know that that character is feeling this moment in a way that is m greater than the words need to tell in that moment because they've told the words previously. So we go back and forth. I talk to authors all the time. And I think that there's, I think that there are arguments to be made for both where you're like, you know what, they're new people, so they should have new voices. And it's nice for the listener to really get that sort of um, like, a, 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 like a richer tapestry of, of voices for a series. It's nice. Um, this was a thing where like, I think Brittany and I were really excited to collaborate together. And so we talked about how we could sort of do a little from column A and a little from column B. And what that meant was, well, why don't we mix up some of the females here and allow the male voices to drive the emotional narrative, at least from an eye toward like knowing the Hansons and the Jameses and the interplay between rival whiskey companies and love and family and all of that. So I think in the series, it definitely made sense. And I, I had this conversation with you. I know I had this conversation with Tiffany um, when I was, you know, trying to figure out that with Dirty Truths, because I had previously engage somebody else to do it and then i was like i can't like after hearing whiskey lies i was like i can't do this like i need to have joe do jay and like continue with the series this is crazy um and I, I had a lot of people be like no it's good to have like multiple narrators and i was like no i really think it's good to have somebody like like you said that can anchor the series and that can voice it and just brings a history to the series um in a way that i think keeps it so that in my mind like it's such a dear series to me and so now to see it like continue to go and i mean the care there's no character that i'm like closer to than jay um i just love jay's character so much jay and cat they're like my absolute favorites um and i think <laughs> everybody was like you cannot have the same person be cash and then be jay and i'm like i i know that everybody said joe was cash but like now joe is jay i don't know what to tell you like he's a different person and then i heard irish and i'm like okay well joe is irish like sorry <laughs> um so i think that it's it's your talent that enables us to do that i don't think every narrator could do that but certainly it works with this series and i'm very happy with it Brittany, that was a lovely monologue uh i'm yeah. not sure if you were uh uh like unpackaging seven pounds of frozen peas at that particular <laughs> moment in time. There was like a crinkling. I don't know oh, what that was. Sorry guys. No, you were great, but 
that's that's what I so I'm so attuned to every sound. I need to know what every sound is. <laughs> <laughs> nope, just sitting here moving a sweater. <laughs> now, as a narrator and having to come up with so many voices, do you ever find yourself when you're just out in public, you know, you're watching people and listening in on conversations, do you find yourself like creating characters in your mind or copying people's voices to like come up with new characters? Do you ever do that? I've been I've been doing that in the kindest, gentlest way possible my entire life. Um, <laughs> and for part of my formal acting training, that kind of behavior was actually, uh, celebrated. Um, I remember, uh, a physical exercise that I worked on in grad school where you had to pick somebody in the department and ask if you could study the way that they walked and the way that they held themselves to do a full physical reworking and you weren't to tell anybody else and the assignment was that you had to just come to class and walk like somebody else that everybody knew who was in the department and not have told anybody and you basically it was a pass fail and it was like did people know who you were or not um wow. and i mean there's a moment in the chameleon effect where liam talks about that very thing actually just that like that human instinct that he had where like if he hears something he likes to sort of parrot it or like see if that lives somewhere in his voice. And I have certainly had similar human tendencies in my, um, in my life. Never, it's never been with an eye toward disparaging or making fun of somebody. It's always been with this sort of wide eyed fascination at how beautifully different everybody is while we are all so, uh, powerfully similar, like, um, and I just, I just love all the little ways that we become individual inside of this space where we share values and energy and drive. And um, so when you talk about or when you ask, like, I'm not coming up with voices. Like, I don't think of what I do as coming up with voices. What I'm trying to do is find the voice of every character. And so practicing accents, for example, like having some facility with that, well, that's going to unlock more roles for me because it's going to allow more people's stories to live somewhere in my skin or my voice um, because I have the ability to tap into what would be a part of their truth. If a character is born and raised in Finland, uh, they're going to you know, need to have some sort of Scandinavian sound. Something is going to have to be that sort of something. And Scandinavian is very tricky, like from Sweden to Denmark to Finland and the nuances. You know, um, um, so that's part of it. But again, the, the real thing is, you know, you take take Frank is a really great example. Like there's a Frank that doesn't have any kind of Southie Boston at all. What Frank has is the heart of a dog. Like he's got the spirit of um protector companion mm -hmm. like loyal ride or die person whose sense of joy and sense of purpose is derived from the love that he can share with the people that he respects and so that's how you make a voice that's how frank's voice because your voice is a reflection of your heart that's it <laughs> like it doesn't have to i don't have to sound different i have to feel whatever these people are feeling and that's the analysis that i had with frank that's kind of the sort of where i saw him deriving his sort of sense of purpose which of course is diametrically opposed in many ways to cash for example who's much more interested in his name, accomplishment, status, drive. So what does that mean? If you're playing a character who is super fucking passionate and really committed to 
running the world, whether that's for the mafia or a fucking whiskey company. Well, what's a choice you could make when it comes to vocalizing that person? They probably talk fast. They probably talk faster than somebody else that, you know, like, they did like, yeah. look at, look at, go to New York city, go mm -hmm. to New York city. What is everybody in New York? Almost every single person that lives in New York, what do they do? They fucking talk fast. Why? They have shit to do. <laughs> they have shit to do. Yep. Go down to, go down to the Blue Ridge mountains, go down to the base of Appalachian, East Tennessee, or go to parts okay. of Kentucky, Alabama. Hey, welcome. Like you spend some time. You got time to, you know, we got fresh sweet tea made. We can hang out in the back about three hours till the sun sets. There's nothing right or wrong about either one of those people. There's nothing better or worse about the fast talking New Yorker or the slow drawled Southerner. It is a fact of their environment, their culture and their upbringing that inform the way that they talk. And so from there, then you make, and then I, you know, and then my hope I, is that they sound different. And somebody, <laughs> somebody do. felt seen in the chat. Somebody was like, oh, that's me. I'm the. Right. I, I do not sound like that. Right. Do I sound like that? <laughs> Very close to those Blue Ridge Mountains. And I live in the South, but I got shit to do too. <laughs> Uh, listen, I again, again, it's not, I, I know, I, it is not a value judgment. I am okay. not here to say anybody is doing it right and anybody else is doing it wrong. I'm simply saying that you can see and then you can, you can see not just how regionalisms again, like, um, what's interesting, of course, is that, um, like Appalachia, that like real mountain, the West Virginia and East Tennessee, North Carolina, the real hill. Like when you're when you're in them hollers and you're all the way out there and you're up in there, those people are actually uh, descended from the same kinds of people who uh, have that Southie Boston, the same kind of thing. The Scotch Irish uh, uh -huh. spent time in both places. You get this Irish descendancy here, and you got this Irish descendancy here too. Both of which are a product of the Irish accent, which is going to have this sort of sing song thing here, or the school, it's just got a bit more of the clipped kind of thing in this part of the mouth. All of that is generation after generation of people being near each other and slowly adjusting and adapting the way that they speak to uh, their environment, their family, and their culture. And um, so those are the accent part of it. But then again, like the style of life, the way you fill your time, that's how the drive of the speech gets informed and mm -hmm. and again when you're working in a genre where almost every single male character is at some point in the story going to be described as having a low deep resonant powerful voice <laughs> well how do you make that different for 700 people and it's about figuring out what that character wants what makes them feel valuable what makes them feel seen what makes them feel scared where are their insecurities? Our insecurities are hidden in our voices too. They're there. Um, and so that's the kind of stuff you gotta unlock. Um, yeah. <laughs> I can't that was believe... fantastic. Right, it was fascinating. <clears throat> I can't believe I bounced around all those places. In and my that was amazing. <laughs> it that did. Was so I mean, some of that Somebody asked where Dr. Bo was from. I said Augusta. That sounds like an Augusta, Georgia accent. You're very, you're very right about Dr. Beaumont. <laughs> Dr. Beaumont is that, he is that, uh, I actually listen. I don't I, hear that where I live. No, I forget, I forget the name. Is. He is some, okay. he is some super, super sexified cross hybrid of like a foghorn leghorn uh, meets meets Val Kilmer's character in Tombstone. Uh, yes. And I the also- The Glass Onion, that character. All I'm hearing is House of Cards. Oh, so yeah, House of Cards is perfect. So, so the other character that I listened to, not a character, there's a senator, there was a senator from Georgia. There was this like, and I found some, I found some interview from some long sitting congressman or senator from like central Georgia. And I was like, this guy, like I, this is the kind of, just that real, Butter melts everywhere around you. Butter goes on all your food. Butter sits in your mouth. Butter <laughs> is the pillars of your house. Uh, That's where I wanted to go with, uh, with him. 
and to your point earlier, Becky, um, Becky Quinn had said that hearing the voice in book one sort of unlocked a level of insight for her in the character into book two. And that's just so yeah. cool to be as an author, to be open to that. And as a performer who spends countless hours by myself in a tiny space to feel that connection and to see that is just so gratifying. Yeah. Is it Absolutely. so exciting to see how that has progressed since you started your career versus where it is now and the, the development and relationships that you have with authors? Um, it's relationships like the one that Brittany and I have been able to develop and foster over the last couple of years have turned this into a community and made me feel connected uh in a way that i just did not feel at all for years and years and years in this space and um i know for example even like that i sort of came to TikTok kicking and screaming um and so glad you did though yes and i am i am too and it's because of the stories that i hear from fans the content that I see created by people that love to consume these stories and the connections I can make with authors and the ability for me to make time like this to celebrate an author whom I respect and now fundamentally just enjoy collaborating with. And, and that's, that's not happening. It, that's not happening anywhere else in any other way. I mean, to the extent, I don't know how much of this we're talking about or if it's now or later or never, but um, Brittany and I are working on another project that she's working on with some other authors. And that meant not just that we were collaborating again, but that she was bringing a part of her writing family over to Blue Nose Audio and that we've had new voices that we've been getting to talk to and share our sort of theories and ideas about how to produce and what would really make these stories sing. Um, and two of the four that we're working with have already reached out separately and said, Hey, I have other books that I want to get produced into audio. Can we have that conversation? Um, and that's just, um, I, again, I, that it's just so much more than just making books and hitting record in a studio now. And it, I, just, yeah, and it's only been like this for me for a year or so. I really felt this connective, and I'm just so grateful for it. So, did I overshare or undershare? Have I jumped the gun or? No, go ahead. Why don't I mean we can we have the time? We've got plenty of time. Um, <laughs> Brittany or Joe, either one of you, would you like to talk about what is next for Blue Nose Audio and Brittany Nicole? Yeah, we, um, I was a little, I would have been a little sad if the end of, um, the billionaires brought us, uh, not another narration with Joe. So of course I had to say, can, can we do this again? Um, and so we have the mom comes coming out, um, next week, mother faker comes out in Kindle and paperback. And then thereafter it comes out with Joe and Maxine again as Beckett and Liv, who are the two main characters, but it's a whole series based upon four women moving into a house that is falling down in Boston um, with their kids. I like to say it's um, Fuller House, but with spice. Um, that's how I've been selling it to people until I found out that Jenny didn't know what Fuller House was. And so she, she thought that I was just saying like the house has gotten fuller. Like she did she not understand. Houses. She she did. Um, just barely. Just barely. She was like, Why do you keep talking about this? Yes, we'll talk about eight, six, seven later, but she just barely, she doesn't know um pop culture, period. And so she was like, What are you talking? Like, why do you keep telling everybody it's Fuller House with spice? Because, you know, people don't understand that. And I was like, You're the only person that doesn't understand this. <laughs> But yeah, so we have this series coming out and very excited for it. So it's it's a really rich world to come right back to the point we were making earlier about getting to know the characters. We spent a lot of time talking to Brittany uh, and the three other writers, uh, Jenny, Jenny Barra 
Daphne Elliott and uh, Swati MH. Is that? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I wish everybody could see right now that I did, in fact, do all that from memory. Uh, <laughs> um, because you're going to have so much overlay from book to book with the characters. I mean, you're literally meeting everybody kind of in and out of each one of these books. And I will say, by the way, uh, Brittany was so committed to the Fuller House analogy that it is uh, actually a written description in Mother Faker. One of the characters actually describes the setup as Fuller House. So I really wanted to make sure people understood. <laughs> she's really leaned into that. Um, but so what it meant was we talked about a couple of things. We're like, well, listen, we need we need some fresh energy. We need some other voices as a part of this world. Um, and so what we've done is we have tapped Teddy Hamilton and Samantha Brentmore to join Maxine and myself. All four of the books are going to be recorded in duet narration, um, where each one of the titles gets a different pairing. So Maxine and I were kicking it off just to kind of like help everyone get started, get the lay of the land. Um, we took copious character notes. We pulled voice references, made sure that um, Samantha and Teddy could dive in with us for the next books. Um, and we'd all be kind of on the same page and really be building a world together. <clears throat> and it meant that we got to sort of spread the creative love around too and get to have different collaborations. Um, and so that part I'm really excited about. Um, so as you said, I'm doing this one with Maxine and then I'll be doing another title with Samantha and then uh, Teddy and Sam will be doing the title together and Teddy and Max will be doing a title as well. So, um, yeah. And then uh, while we're here, because I just did them, I will introduce you to uh, there's all of these mothers have children. So there's lots of kids running around. Oh, yes. Um, lots and of kid voices. So, so cool. these are the uh, these are the boys. Um, these are the boys that are in the house. Uh, I will say that I feel like the girls maybe shade just a hair cuter, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the boys are who they are. So you gotta you gotta lean into the reality of who they are. So um, the oldest boy is Liam, and like Liam just kind of Liam's just kind of over all of it. Like Liam just kind of wants to be doing something else. Like he's like the big kid in the house and like doesn't really want to deal with any of these people. Mm -hmm. He wants to just like you know be a kid and like be going and doing cool kid stuff like not with these nerds uh so that's liam um and then you, you have kai um kai's kai's maybe having the hardest time like Aww. as a as a kid like maybe him and his mom their circumstances for being in the house are maybe kind of like the toughest for him to deal with and kai's just he's super shy and just like pretty quiet and right now just kind of taking the world in and just kind of being here um and then uh Beckett's love interest uh she has uh, a four-year-old and his name is Finn and he just loves life he uses a lot of extra s's in words and stuff like sometimes verbs is verbs is with more s's on them and it's just like I like him so happy that Becky's here and I call him boss man and we just like do the coolest stuffs together. Like I'm gonna wear a tutu and have a nerf gun and glitter bomb this whole house. Let's do it. <laughs> That's amazing. That's exactly amazing. I'm I'm halfway through it right now reading it, and that is exactly how I heard it, Joe. That was perfect. Yeah, uh, so that's so that's Finn, Kai, <laughs> and Liam. <laughs> the boys the boys in the house. I really want to hear the Shining Twins. I can't wait for that. Oh, yes. That's going <laughs> to... <laughs> you guys, this book is oh. hilarious. And I know Joe has gone through like his dark era in this last year. <laughs> but if you have not heard him do some rom-com, this is your opportunity. Because these books are so hilarious. They are so, so funny. Yeah, yeah, I wrote this at the same time I wrote Irish, if you can imagine that. <laughs> I was like, one day it would be like heavy, heavy, and then the next day. And both books had kids, so I had to be very careful to give Leo and uh, Lorenzo their own personalities and not have them overlap with the other kids that were like in a very different um, position, because I was writing at the exact same time. 
Um, but yes, I, it was cathartic to say the least. Uh, I just want to, uh, I want to jump in and say per some of the stories we've told on things, I know that maybe like, uh, some of the stories that have gotten a little more attention that I worked on this last year uh, are in that sort of darker vein. And I know that sort of across Romance Landia and the social circles in particular, it feels like dark romance is really having its moment. Um, but I, I want to say definitively that like, I am just here to tell love stories uh, and that I try to be as mindful as I can about uh, the kinds of stories I tell because I really want to make room for all of the love stories and uh, um, yeah and so whether that's something like a 40 year old uh, you know baseball executive living in his father's shadow uh, looking for love in all the wrong places or uh, somebody whose trauma has defined a great deal of their life and sent them in a different direction uh, yeah they're, they're all there, and I'm always trying to find as many of them to tell because um, I think everybody's love story deserves to be told, so. And you Absolutely. do it so well. You do it so well. Um, I want to go back and talk about Cash, Jay, and Frank for a second. Um, so, Joe, with these three characters that you played, did you feel like you could identify personality-wise with any of these characters more so than the others? Um, I mean... Like, did you feel like you were more like, or you could, you felt more of a connection, I guess, with any of those characters? And then who would you want to be more like in real life? I certainly feel, uh, I certainly feel a strong energy connection to Cash James. Um, yeah, I, I just think uh, a lot of the energy and intentionality, that focus on career, that living and loving in a, just a, a very big way. Um, Cash doesn't compromise. Um, and he unapologetically has set extremely high standards for himself and um, the world around him. And... Um, so I think that cash is probably the answer to that first question. And then with respect to the man I'd, I'd want to be the most like, I, I think, uh, per my answer about Frank earlier and his personality, um, who doesn't want to be that friend who derives joy from the love of those around you and, um, you know, sees value in being a companion and a friend and an enforcer. Um, so, yeah. And then, okay. you know, well, I guess we could take Jay's extremely filthy mouth along for the <laughs> ride soon. Yeah. Well, moving into another fun question. And Brittany, you get to answer this one as well, and I will answer it too. But uh, kiss Mary unalive. So, because, you know, you can't say certain things on here. So kiss Mary unalive, cash Jay Frank. Brittany, you go first. I mean, Frank has a piercing, so we're definitely going to kiss him um, because it's not really kissing. Um, on a live would unfortunately be cash because I have to say I have to marry Jay. We're the same. The, exact the songs. Thing. The I'm songs. <laughs> Sorry. It's the songs. It's the music for me. Um, I'm 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 marrying Frank. Uh, I'm fucking cash and. Uh, <laughs> And then killing Jay because it's it's too much cold play for me at the end of the day. I'm sorry, but it's no, just too it's much cold play. play. No. So. Say it ain't so, Weezer. <laughs> by the way. Say it ain't so. Yes. Okay. Listen, there are no wrong answers there, right? No, not at all. No, there's no wrong answers. Um, Joe would you be willing to do some live narration from irish and share um, something with us okay uh just to tease the book a little bit and get a little more of that boston accent okay um <clears throat> hold on let me uh can you hear me from here yeah. like 
I've, t I've turned my head slightly so I can look at a, at a script here. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, this is a small section from a shorter chapter near the beginning of the book. Um, this is chapter four. Um, it's kind of one of the, it's one of the first chapters where you get to really kind of know, uh, Frank and, it's one of these things that I think is really um, unique, special, and interesting about voice acting with book scripts rather than play scripts or film scripts. And that's that all of the subtext is text. It's all here. Um, so I really relish these opportunities to share the the journey and the feelings the just the fucking feelings so um all right let me i gotta turn this so i can stay you stay good job all right <clears throat> even at 12 i was smart enough to recognize rare beauty at 18 i came back for her but i was too late I sigh heavily as I pour a glass of Angel's whiskey. My best friend almost lost the woman he loved too, but he was smart enough to fix things while he had the chance. He made something of himself. Now and then I see glimpses of his life and I'm so fucking proud of who he is. I just wish I could call him. Spend an hour chatting with him here, side by side on the deck, watching the stars reflect off the ocean waters. It's lonely talking to myself. And I can't tell Shane about any of it. I don't know what I'll tell him when it's all said and done, but he can never know about that life. He can never put together the pieces. If he ever knew the cash his brother-in-law put a bullet in his father's head and that I covered it up, he'd never forgive me. And then the cycle of revenge would start all over again. So instead, I walk out to the deck. The cool June air is biting because it's Maine and we're on the ocean and it's just fucking cold right now. Shaking off the chill, I settle in one of the Adirondack chairs with my whiskey and talk to the sky. No one else is around to listen. The sounds of gravel crunching and a car engine have me rocking forward in my seat and spilling my whiskey in my lap. Fuck, I mutter. I must have fallen asleep. A glance at the outdoor clock on the side of the house tells me it's almost 3 a.m. Who the fuck would be coming down the road in the middle of the night? To those who don't know of its location, hell, its fucking existence, the house is impossible to find. The narrow dirt roads are practically impossible to travel at night because it's so dark. I barely drive them after the sun goes down and I know them by heart. Whoever is here either knows where they're going or has skills I don't take lightly. Either way, I stride to the closet where I keep the guns then peer out from behind the curtains to assess the danger. To say I'm shocked by the view in front of me is putting it mildly. What is she doing here? So good. That's great. So, so, so good. I like him there, in the moment. Yes. Uh. So that's, that's a, that's the, you know, yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a part of, that's, there's, that's a part of action. It's a part of internal monologue. It's a part of, um, yeah, it's a part of his story, part of their story, so. Perfect. I know. I'm just, you know. I know. <laughs> um, I and I I enjoy doing um I do enjoy doing some of these uh live because I think um one of the one of the joyous upsides of having done uh a lot of these stories now is that like my facility with cold reading and just kind of like getting into the space and getting the words off the page and getting them right um, has gotten better. It's just gotten better. And so it's nice to be able to, I think there's something to be said for 
being connected enough to do. I mean, that was basically a whole chapter that I just is a short chapter, admittedly, but um, to do it in one take and just be in that space and be feeling what Frank feels and let it kind of come out organically um, is it's a it feels really good. And I like to come here. I saw I saw a different video. Uh, I saw somebody post a, a video about another book recently and it was like, well, I'm sure that he like does the one character voice and then goes back and does the other character voice. And I want it to be like, no, I don't. <laughs> right. I, I do the whole thing at once. Once I know the voices well enough, like I don't even highlight my scripts. I like just go. And um, yeah. And I, I think there's, I think that's fun. I think that's just a kind of a cool mm -hmm. thing. So um, thanks for the opportunity. I appreciate it. It's incredible. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just the talent that you have, the experience that you have too, the fact that you just said you don't highlight your scripts. But something I noticed that both you and Maxine did on this book that was so amazing, and I, I talked about it in a video I posted earlier today, there are so many times in this book where, you know, dialogue tags were removed and what those are, that's the he said, she said, he sighed, she laughed those were removed and you guys were just acting with the sounds that you were making and conveying such strong emotion in so many parts of this book without having any other context as far as um you know those dialogue tags or anything else like just the the way that you would breathe or exhale in a moment gives the listener the opportunity to know exactly what that character is feeling. And it's, that is not something that is easily attained, I think, in an audiobook production. So good job. Um, <laughs> right. Fantastic. I mean, I, I felt like I heard it so much more on this book in particular than I have on any other book I have listened to so far. I, I want to say one thing about that, which is I personally do not highlight scripts that I'm working on to keep track of characters. The Blue Nose audio production team takes script prep extraordinarily seriously. Um, and we have some internal ideas as a company about how we feel books are best done and brought to life in that way. Um, and without delving too deeply into uh, the way we do what we do, I will say that I'm glad that you hear those kinds of things. And I want you to know that there are a lot of people um, who uh, don't get enough credit, don't get enough praise, who are doing the hard work of helping find the truth and the life and the, and the spaces for breath and over, all that stuff. And um, so those things, um, they're deliberate and they're thought about. Um, and there's something that our team and the authors that we collaborate with um, work to find and bring out because it's a different experience than reading a book. And, it's so different. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think you can, you know, for example, if, if, I mean, if somebody's writing and there's six characters in a scene, well, it's important to let the reader know who everybody is basically at all times right mm -hmm. but if you've just cast as a multicast five different actors for those you know six people or whatever you may not need to identify them all the time because they have very different voices they're like different people so um those are the kinds of things we are thinking about and working on to create a seamless and as dynamic and interactive listening experience as we can with nothing more than some beautiful human beings words and some other beautiful human beings attempt at emotionally recreating those words in a landscape that allows a listener to immerse themselves in those stories. Mm -hmm. And you really do. I mean, you get lost in it. I've said it even with, I mean, especially with the spicy scenes, you always, I think that when it's done duet style, you very much feel like almost like a peeping Tom, <laughs> like I'm not supposed to be listening into this because holy crap, it is like real right now. Um, and it's just done so well. Um, and throughout any, you know, all of the chapters, but especially those spicy ones. 
Yeah, I listen, I think um I think some stories still get really well served by um by a, a strong dual narration and one of my favorite trends in social media posts are those shout outs for uh the female identifying narrators who do incredible male voices. Mm -hmm. Um Aaron Mellon, CJ Bloom, Emma Wilder, Maxine Mitchell, Lucy Rivers. Those are just a couple that jump to my mind. Like, I mean, I mean so good that sometimes I hear them and I'm like, you that there's no way, there's no way you play that for a stranger and they don't know that that's not a guy. There's no way. Yep. Yeah. Chess was listening to one the other day and I thought that. And so, so for those moments, I, I guess I just I'm I want to make room for people that still really enjoy and for the artistry of what it is like to be both of those people in that moment. And the same way we talked about it, like a narrator staying on throughout a series, like how they can bring that sort of level of emotional truth. The same thing can happen to one narrator playing all of the parts in a chapter. Mm -hmm. When you're doing all those things, it gives you permission to dive in in a way that creates a new level of truth. That's a more intimate and honest reflection of your interpretation of that story. So. Yes, no, yep. and I know that. Yeah. Did we have 269 people in here? <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important number. Mm -hmm. uh, in the in the audio attic, the number 69 has become so sacred that a lot of the posts that I that I share uh end up getting it, it hits 69 likes and then everybody stops and then people stop and i'm like you guys please keep, <laughs> keep liking okay. it look look we're over 269 now it's better right what's better than 269 let's get to 369, 369. yeah right. let's keep going. keep going <laughs> until we're here for 6969 there you go we'll... somebody just said 6969 there you go yeah <laughs> And for anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, the Audio Attic is a community that um, Joe and some others started, I guess, what, two years ago? And it's a, there's a Discord involved, so it's a smaller community of people who love romance books, and it's connected to Joe's Patreon, so he has some additional content that you can only get there. So if you're interested in that, you can look that up. Yes. March, it's a, it's a, March will be the uh, March will be the three year anniversary. Oh, we'll March be going year. into our fourth year. Wow! Very exciting. Congratulations! Thank you. It's been amazing. It's been a place for me to create content, celebrate authors, build relationships, and the community has. Um, built this incredible space where you don't have to apologize for what you love and how you love. You just have to love. And that's what we've made foundational. And it has really, it's become a joyous, joyous place that's doing a lot of good for a lot of people. And I'm really grateful to be a part of it. It's very, very positive. Sometimes on platforms like this, you can see a lot of negativity, but um, I've been kind of in and out of the attic for about a year and never seen negativity there so it just kind of shrinks everything down so that you can have a community of people and chat with them um about the books and the audiobooks that honestly, you love so honestly my favorite one of my favorite things to see in the audio attic is folks that leave and come back um because it reinforces that everyone knows like that the door is open this is not a baseball game or a concert there's there is re-entry you come and go as you please the space is there if it's going to benefit you i'm not pushing it i'm not trying to sell it to anybody i'm just creating and letting people know what i'm doing and if it speaks to you and it's something you want to be a part of it's there and if it's what you need now always or sometimes then just know that there's always a spot for you to to jump in and connect so yeah <clears throat> did my did TikTok decide that I should no longer have good internet for this? <laughs> it, I'm now seeing like little red dots next to him, which I don't know if I saw them before. Did you? You see red dots too? 
Oh, there he's paused. He's but paused. But I live in Gig City. Now he, no, we he's back. He's normal now. Internet in the entire world. <laughs> they they said, are you in Sevio's basement? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't have internet uh, uh -huh. issues like that here. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a live action uh, mm -mm romance that I'm working on. I've actually been uh, oh. I've been kidnapped and I'm in Se Sebio's basement. And, um, <laughs> it's a live action. I need that would be an interesting. I need a super badass uh, FMC <laughs> or or an MMC who's open to new experiences to come save me. <laughs> to come save me. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, on it. We'll write that right now. <laughs> Down that <at> Britain. <laughs> no, I'm going into my hockey world. We are not we are not giving any more stories to me. Somebody else can handle that one. I think yeah. I don't know. Maybe there's a way for like the TikTok community <laughs> to just live write that. We'll get in here and um, <laughs> I'll just share a like a word doc and we'll just start penning it or we'll voice it. We'll do the whole thing. There you go. Just like start narrating it right from the beginning. Yeah. Live audio stories improvised. There you go. So I'm sure you guys have had this experience and maybe people in the comments have had this experience of reading or listening to a book and there's something about the plot or the characters and you think this has happened to me in real life. Like this feels very real in this moment because I have felt a little bit of that with the mom comms. Oh yeah. Um, Mother Faker, because when you first told me about it, it is so similar to my real life experience. Yes. <laughs> now, granted, like all of my girlfriends, we're already married and we don't actually live in the same house, but the neighborhood that I live in, I was the first one to live here. And then we had five of my best friends, we they all moved to the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so my best friend lives across the street. She has three kids, I have two kids. So they don't, they have grown up not really understanding that this is my house and that is their house. So it's just constantly kids in and out. It is complete chaos, cooking dinners together and yeah. having like that, um, uh, that the mom's friendship and being together and raising your kids together. It's very much a part of <laughs> uh, my reality. So as I've been reading this, I have just been cracking up because you have nailed so <laughs> much of it. And I can't imagine actually living under one roof like that because it's complete chaos. I mean, honestly, Beckett is the star of that book. He made oh, like, cause it's just putting him through everything that I think makes it so much fun. I was just like, I mean, Beckett comes from the billionaires. So he is actually best friends with Jay in um, Extra Dirty. So him and Gavin, we meet there. So like, I just kind of imagined like, if you put any of those billionaires in this house, like what would that entail? and that's what happened <laughs> it was just hilarity like just the disaster and like the swear jar and the twins and the it's just been, it, that was just e easy easy writing honestly it it flowed so easy a thousand dollars for the swear <laughs> jar come on now he's got he's got the he's got the money so, so I think when you're plotting all these different books, like because reading the mom com, we we have mention of uh, of Jay already and his family, and then there's been mention of Ford and Lake from Revenge Era. Do you plot all of that out, or just as you sit down to start writing, you think, okay, how can I connect other characters from my other books? So Gavin Langfield is actually from Whiskey Lies. He was somebody that Cash got jealous of in the first book. And I can't tell you, I think that it was when we started talking about the mom comms, which was before I wrote Extra Dirty. I had written Dirty Truths, but I hadn't written Extra Dirty yet. And Jenny had said to me, let's do the mom comms and let's have a billionaire. And I was like, huh, I wonder how I can like link these series because we're going to be going from one series to the next. 
Um, and I said, oh, I have a billionaire that I mentioned like many, many moons ago in Whiskey Lies. I mean, to me, that feels like years ago because it was literally years ago. Um, and so I was like, I think that there's like a man. And she was like, yeah, his name's Gavin Langfield. I was like, well, I'm glad that you know. Um, and so that's how we got. And I was like, I'm going to give him some brothers. And you know what? Like, we're going to have them play hockey. And but this guy is going to be like, he's going to own a baseball team. I don't know. Like, I I just pull stuff out of nowhere i've got to be honest i just make shit up <laughs> isn't that what like being an author is you just make I shit up so i love when you get involved with an author and you're reading multiple books and you can see all the different crossover characters it's yes. fun because you fall in love with a character and you want you want to see glimpses even just tiny little glimpses of them again Yes, and you will see all of, you will see some people from the other series, including my Bristol Bay series in Mother Faker, and then the all of the Langfield brothers, which are in the momcoms, then get their spinoff in my hockey series starting in March. So, yeah, I like to continue the series and just keep going. Yeah, it's fun. So when did... Were you announcing the date of when the audiobook for Mother Faker will be available? Are we announcing that, Joe? I don't have a calendar in front of me, but I, I know we, when it is. I'm just asking, are, am I allowed to announce it? I think we're announce, we're putting it up tomorrow, so I can. Okay. Well, then these 269 people get to hear it first. <laughs> 257. Oh, 60. What a joy. Um, if we get to 269, then we can. No. Um, yeah, February 20th is the first um, MomCom that will be available as in, in audio. Yes. And then it will be once a week, I believe, is the plan thereafter. So you're going to get four um, books with four groupings of narrators um, and four very different stories, but all with the craziness in the house and all found family and a lot of laughs. And that was my goal this year was just everything I'm writing this year. The goal is to have lots of laughs and just 2024 is the, is the year of smiling. Yeah. And these are all, these are all full length books. This is like, yeah. these are fully realized three dimensional three act stories um, that I think one of the joys will be that by the time you get to the fourth mom's uh, HEA, she's been such a part of the story because she's been in the house with these other women, which by the way, mom comes, uh, works in a bunch of different uh, contexts, one of which is that they refer to the house as their mom commune. So uh, <laughs> it is both just about the house that they're in. Um, and I think the the stories have the kind of they have some of that nice levity uh, and sort of crazy outlandish scenes um, that are super fun. Um, but yeah, and the, so the idea too is like one a week once we get this thing going, and Maxine and Samantha and Teddy and myself are immersed in that world uh, right now. Um, and yeah, as everybody is now pointing out, we are uh, dealing with. <laughs> The, you won't get any more. That's the golden it. That's handcuffs it. Like of <laughs> my. I have six point nine thousand uh, likes, likes yeah, and uh, and now everybody is no one wants to touch it. So. Nobody's touching you. <laughs> I, I, I'm so excited to hear all four of you guys do comedy because I think the four of you excel at that. Just the comedic timing is so, yeah. so good. I just had an idea that I'm just going to say out loud and then maybe someday it can happen. Um, if there is uh, a signing event or a live event where the four of us are attending, uh, we could pull scenes from all yes. four of these books and do uh, short little chapter reads together as a little like round robin tour de force <laughs> yes. vibes. Because... Uh, <laughs> It is, it's, yeah, and we are, and there, I, um, I don't a hundred percent know everybody's sort of training background, but I believe, um, Teddy, Maxine and Samantha, I, I believe all three of them have like stage backgrounds and like mm -hmm. come from that world. So, um, I'm here for that kind of stuff. I just love getting to do that kind of stuff with my colleagues. So, so fun. I mean, watching when you guys did uh, These Walls Can Talk live in Vegas, which I'm mm -hmm. sure there's probably a lot of people 
here that got to watch that. I mean, it was an incredible experience to be able to watch you guys live narrate scenes together. So much fun. So any opportunity to do something like that in the future, I mean, listeners are going to be here for it. <laughs> yes. To the brave, beautiful soul that sent me heart snaps, that took me over to seven, <laughs> seven thousand K. Uh, my heart, my heart snaps, my heart snaps for you. I, I want to finger your heart. And no, no, hold on. No, that doesn't sound totally right. Okay, um, the little, those little things that look like the finger snaps, they look like shrimp to me. I thought they were shrimp at first. What is it? Yeah, they're finger hearts. Finger snap with a little heart on it, but I thought they were shrimp. <laughs> Oh, I, can't was, I, I I thought oh, that's not a shrimp. I uh I thought um, I it, like yep. it does kind of look like a shrimp. Well, it looks like like a rounded thing. No. Like a clit? Is it like a clit? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I don't know. I don't it study them that, like that like closely. <laughs> Says the woman that writes about them. I like I write things. I should, don't study them. <laughs> <clears throat> that's uh, not my forte. <laughs> Joseph Michael. <laughs> my Georgia. I don't live in Georgia, but I have. Okay, I am also a lightweight, and this is very, very strong. So I'm feeling pretty good right now. I'm surprised my nose isn't bright red. <laughs> it's 14, 14 ingredients. Everything in else there. is. It is. Yeah, 13. 13 ingredients in this. 13 ingredients, and they're all booze. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> lots of bitters, lots of different bitters he uses. Um, yeah, Danielle, Danielle just sent me a gummy. Little did you know, uh, it's a weed gummy. So, you know, <laughs> TikTok is next level now. <laughs> I didn't see it. I missed it. I'm sad that I missed it. Somebody send another one of those. Send one of those my way. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you need it. I don't think you're supposed to eat those if you're drinking alcohol anyway. Oh, God. This, this portion of the live is brought to you by James Whiskey. <laughs> I've got James the cup. Whiskey. Open oh, up a bottle with friends. Now you can see it better. There we go. Oh, I love it. That was made by the last chapter bookshop. Yeah, it did Justin a good job. asked me, he was like, do you want one of those James Whiskeys? Like, oh, <laughs> that was the greatest thing you've ever done. Oh, uh, well, I was afraid that he would think, like, what are you doing over there by the liquor cabinet? But he's got this game that he plays on his phone, so he wasn't paying attention when I said was, That was fantastic. <laughs> I thought I would fool him a little bit, and he would say, do you mean Jameson? <laughs> it didn't. He he just thought, <laughs> what did he say? He's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> he, was so, he was so mad. He was like, I've never heard of that. What are you talking about? Is there a whiskey yeah. I haven't heard of? <laughs> Where is the James whiskey? Have either of you ever been to a distillery? Uh, my, probably. <laughs> is, I've only been to one. I've been to Four Roses. I've been to that distillery. Yeah, I've been to I've been to many <laughs> distilleries. I've been to a Scotch <laughs> distillery. I've been to a whiskey distillery. I've been to a bourbon distillery. Um, are they all kind of the same? I mean, yeah, I, there are elements of the process that are slightly different. At the end of the day, all of these things are about, um, you know, adjusting levels to create certain chemical processes that uh, turn, you know, sugar into alcohol. And then that's what changes the body chemistry when you consume it. So that part of the process is the same but um, the amount of corn and rye and mash that you use and the style of the um, vessels that you're using to heat the water, where the water is sourced is a big deal for scotch in particular. Um, yes. Like most of the flavor, I think what's interesting about scotch is for me, it's a very pure uh, drinking experience because so much of the flavor is actually the water. Which I think is really nice. I, there's something, I don't know, there's something very pure about that process to me. Um, the rocks, where the water comes from, like it gives the 
flavor. It gives Is that it where some, the smoky flavor comes from in scotch? Well, it depends if you... So not all scotch has that kind of very oaky, peaty oh. flavor. There's some water that's used that's that flows over peat moss and when the water flows over the peat moss it gets that very earthy oaky flavor other parts of scotland the water is pulled from rivers that are uh, all limestone and it's a much smoother flatter uh starting ingredient and so it it totally changes the flavor and then you got bourbon which um the the, the popularity of bourbon has created its own kind of like crisis economy because they have to be aged in um, virgin smoked charred barrels. Like it's a part of the law of bourbon producing. And now that the liquor is extremely popular, you're con they're just constantly making more and more of these barrels. So you're seeing all these new industries pop up like uh, bourbon, bourbon barrel maple syrup or bourbon barrel furniture or bourbon barrel, barrel Cabernet Sauvignon. Bourbon barrel Cabernet. Why? Uh -huh. There are all these fucking bourbon barrels sitting around that they can't use again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, I've been, and I got to say, actually, like, um, parts of distillery tours have a pretty intense scent to them. I prefer a brewery tour. Um, yeah. I also like a good brewery tour. I went to one in uh, Wisconsin um, where they, they stop like there's like four or five stops along the way and you have like little half pints of beer while you're there. And, uh, it's called, uh, Lakefront. I don't know. Lakefront brewery, I think in around Milwaukee, I think, um, they do, they may, they put cherry in a beer and it's very good. Uh -huh. <laughs> I would like that. Um, and then I lived, so I lived in, I lived in Edinburgh for a year and Edinburgh is where they make tenants, which is a, like a, kind of it's like i don't want to call it scottish budweiser because that'll probably get me in trouble with the scots that are listening but um it's like <laughs> a very consumable scottish lager mm. and the city kind of has this malty smell because they're making the tenants there um and it's a i don't know the brewery experience is kind of a chill it's just chill vibes i like going to well the difference really a brewery is very sanitary right like that's really important to the brewing process i remember my oldest daughter was two years old when we went to four roses and we called ahead of time to see if we could even bring her and we're like oh yeah it's family friendly bring the kids it's fine it was <laughs> like these open gi giant vats of bourbon that they were brewing and you're walking up these metal staircases where someone could just fall in and so i'm clinging to my two-year-old to make sure that she stayed safe during the whole tour and i thought this is so different than a brewery uh amanda said that i would love grand rapids uh amanda i do love grand rapids i've been to grand rapids uh and there is uh there's one spot where they have like um They've got like vintage video games that you can play and a very good cheeseburger. And then Founders is there. Uh, Founders is a brewery I like very much. And uh, they have a <laughs> phenomenal pretzel. So you get yourself a pint oh. and a fantastic pretzel at Founders if you find yourself in Grand Rapids. I like a pretzel. And then they have, a, they have a nice little art museum there that's called Graham because it's the Grand Rapids Art Museum. <laughs> and then you can, go say, you can go say hi to some some president somebody's somebody's there <laughs> somebody's there Somebody, who's there uh Fo ford maybe the ford museum or the presidential museum no his his body <laughs> oh well no every president has a museum that's made for them Oh yeah, maybe that's there. Okay. Anyway, I apologize. Body. We're no longer. You asked about a distillery, and yes, I've been to distilleries. <laughs> was that the question? That was the question. If you've ever been to a distillery. Yes, I should have just said yes. <laughs> have either of you ever tried Chattanooga whiskey? No. I don't, know I don't really drink. I don't really drink whiskey. I, I wrote a well, series a about a whiskey drink. company, but I do not drink it. Yeah, it's technically a bourbon, but it yeah. is made close to Chattanooga. It's called Chattanooga whiskey. So it's been very popular. 
Maybe you can bring it to Florida and we can try it there. <laughs> Ooh, I should bring you a bottle. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Mm -hmm. That sounds like fun. Whiskey or bourbon. Yeah. I mean, I never drank bourbon at all. Neither of us did until we lived in Louisville, Kentucky. And if you live in Louisville, you have to drink bourbon. <laughs> like, it's a thing. You have to like horse racing. <laughs> <laughs> be on board with the derby and drink bourbon so that's when our bourbon tasting started and every night justin would say taste this taste this and every night i'd say oh i hate it i hate it after about a year i said mm, i like that it's good <laughs> sarah says she doesn't do dark liquor sarah doesn't do liquor period <laughs> wow. she doesn't. i just i get sleepy and this will probably give me a headache this one drink so i'll have to take some advil before bed it's the rye. Rye, um, rye will give me a headache. I know. <laughs> Wait, Azucar said there's a Lagunitas in Chicago. Lagunitas, I've been to Lagunitas. It's in uh, Petaluma. It's outside. It's outside Wine Country in mm. California. So they have a spot in. Uh, oh, you know where I went recently? Do you know what's made its way on this side of the, of the pond here? Uh, <laughs> the pond. Guinness has opened up a... Uh, no. Yeah, in Baltimore. Baltimore? It's... They do, they do a proper Irish breakfast, which is really all I care about. And they have um, Guinness's uh, Foreign Extra Stout, which is their best mm -hmm. beer. Wait, what is a proper Irish breakfast? Joe? Uh, proper, a proper Irish breakfast is um, eggs, uh, tomatoes, uh, beans, um, mm -hmm. bacon, but like thick cut bacon, so like in rashers, uh, sausage links, and then uh, black pudding and white pudding and toast. Kind of pudding is black pudding and white pudding uh black black pudding is a is a blood pudding um and it oh. is it's the it's it's a sausage made from the blood and the white and white this. pudding is uh isn't isn't is the intestinal pudding mm -hmm. um and it's like you might not want to ask that question but is there any orzo pasta with <laughs> no the i mean the beans the beans kind of look like a thing but uh <laughs> a thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, orzo pasta. Yeah. It's just ruined for me. <laughs> and cookies and cream ice cream. Mm. <laughs> Forever. Forever. No, I've never tried um, that kind of pudding before. I think that would be... It's one of those things, if you know what it is going into the tasting, it it worse yes yeah it's better like i went to japan a long long time ago with a friend or a friend lived there and we went to a yakiniku restaurant and so they bring you the raw meat and you cook it in front of you you cook it yourself and um there was all kinds of meat on the tray i didn't know what it was and i would ask her and she go oh i, I don't know how to translate just eat it which was probably the right decision because i tasted tongue i had cow tongue i had intestine um, stomach, some other parts of the cow that we don't normally eat <laughs> in our culture. It must have looked really awesome on your plate was, before yeah, you cooked okay, it. You know, I, I was being treated to dinner. Her aunt and uncle were taking us to this very expensive restaurant, and I was going to be the, I am the guest, yeah. and I am going to eat what is put in front of me, and... Did it taste good? No. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it. I loved it. I did not. <laughs> the texture, it was texture thing. Texture yeah, was really different. I could see that. Mm -hmm. I could see that. <laughs> so in the Boston Billionaires book, uh, they they eat sometimes food. They go to, to restaurants and, and things and they, uh, <laughs> this is my, uh, they don't need that. Just my joking attempt to, to to pull us back into the. Although I mean, we're turning this into some sort of virtual uh, food tour. Yes. Uh, I'm seeing I some folks this. in the this chat. No, we yeah. only eat them um, waffles and you know pizza in the oh, Boston oh, billionaires. 
We eat waffles. Waffles. From pancakes and, and, you know, uh, and yeah, Irish makes the pancakes, the gluten-free pancakes. Yeah. And the meatballs. We do have meatballs. <laughs> uh, I thought, I thought that I knew how to make pancakes. Mm. Um, but it turns out that uh, all I was doing was adding uh, water and chocolate chips to Krusty's uh, pancake mix. Mm. And I just like, I was convinced that that was just, this is, <laughs> this is how you make pancakes. pancakes. Yeah. Uh, and then somebody informed me that that's a pancake mix and that there's actually mm -hmm. ingredients you could use to, mm -hmm. to actually make it. And I'm like, you, what? Okay. So. <laughs> I, no, I feel you. I feel you. I had an, a time in college where I was talking to a friend who loved to bake everything from scratch. She used that terminology. I said, well, I make cookies from scratch. She said, well, what do you do? And I said, I buy the tube. <laughs> and I cut the, the cookie dough and I put it on the tray. She goes, Tiffany, that's not from scratch. And I said, well, but it's raw. <laughs> it's the same thing. That's when I learned what from scratch meant. <laughs> I was probably about 20 years old, you guys. Mm -hmm. I should have known. Mm -hmm. That's great. That was from scratch. Well, I'm sure that you make everything from scratch now as a mom. <laughs> Somewhere in the universe is a video of me i don't know in second in second grade we all had to do um tutorial videos and my tutorial video was i taught my second grade class how to make cho chocolate chip pancakes from uh from a bag of crusties again i thought i was doing like the whole thing here but apparently all i was doing and i just remember um because there was this girl in the in the class that i had a crush on uh and she i used the word i used the phrase you got to get it to the right consistency like a thousand times <laughs> so cute <laughs> so um all right well i have uh books to prep and stories to to go focus on so i'll leave you with second and you have a drink to refill or advil to take or wherever you are in your... one, drink, one drink tiff i am i'm good to go okay. <laughs> cheap date over here mm. um well thank you for having me cheers to uh to irish and Brittany. again thank you for uh your willingness your trust your collaboration your spirit of adventure and your incredible way with words and characters it's been a joy and i'm excited to continue to tell stories with you Yay. thank you cheers to you joe thank, thank you so you. much for taking your time to be here really appreciate thank you. you thank you thank you for having me thank you for hosting uh thank you for finding fun, honest, authentic ways to celebrate stories that you love and build and grow this community. Uh, you're making it possible for more and more people to say that love stories and listening to love stories is a thing that they like. Uh, you're helping normalize beautiful, normal behavior, and I am here for it and thrilled to be here with you both tonight. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very now much. Now 96, so technically it's 69. So there's that. There we go. <laughs> and with that, he's gone. <laughs> Nobody can screw this up now. <laughs> he's out. That's great. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Oh, uh, my goal, my goal in life. I want everyone to try an audiobook who has never tried one before. I just know how much it has changed my life, impacted my life. And I was the person that was adamant that I am not gonna like those. And I had to eat my words. So now I wanna help other people discover that too. But also I wanted to hint a little bit for Irish. Um, so I run an audiobook club on FB with two friends and um might that might be one of our picks of the month coming up soon so it's called the aural romance audiobook club 
So please, if you have not joined us, come and join us. Just we talk about audiobooks all day long. People are just putting up recs, what they're listening to, what they love. Um, if they're looking for something specific, and then every month we have at least two books that we pick and we have pin posts with just a chat thread. So if you want to listen to one of those with somebody else that month, you listen to it and you can chat about it, but you don't have to. It's the most laid back book club you will ever be a part of or not be a part of. Just come and join us. It's a lot of fun. But just come. Just come. Be a yeah. part. The title that Joe is working on narrating for me right now is Mother Faker. I was like, what book? I don't know. Because for so long, it was like he was literally working on like five of them at the same time. Oh, oh. But yes. now we're down to one. So it's Mother Faker, Mother Maker, Mother Pucker, Pucker, and Mother Hater. Hater. Yeah. So you get the tropes in each title. So you get a fake marriage a maker is an accidental pregnancy then you have a hockey romance and then you have a enemies to lovers with hater I love it. yes 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 the group is on my page um i think i have a link to it in my bio on my profile if you go to my link tree How long does aural, what? aural romance so think ears aural romance audiobook club uh jessica is in the chat She's uh, one of the. She's on, it. She's on She's it. on it. She will make sure everybody knows. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. We have over two thousand members. You do uh, in a year. We started January first of last year, and it's been fantastic. Uh, Brittany, do you have any signings planned for this year? I will be at several. I will be at Readers Take Denver with Tiffany. Tiffany will be helping me, thank goodness. Um, and then I will be in Nashville, and hopefully Tiffany will be there too. <laughs> um, and then I will be in Boston. That's, that's an easy one for me to get to. Yeah, then I'll be in Boston at the Sinners and Stardust. Um, that is in August. And then I will be in Love and Vegas um in october so very excited for all of those and to meet more people okay. yes do you have pre-orders for readers take denver yes there i just posted it in the readers take denver group um but if you also go onto my instagram or my profile um it's in my link tree uh the one in nashville is called romance era romance era experience experience yeah and, and it's brand new and it's actually it's cool because the first night is some type of like ball i think i want to say um and then the next day is like the signing and then the night of the signing they've like rented out the top of the hotel and like where the pool is and they're having like a singer come and they're doing like music so it's supposed to be pretty like very um like cool event i would say yeah and it's their first one so i'm excited i just like nashville i'm excited to just i think i'm going a day early and you know gonna enjoy it so fun yeah that's just a two-hour drive for me that's so a very fun. easy get in and get out it's annoying I, how difficult it is to fly there for me. It shouldn't be so hard. Really? Do you have several layovers or something? No, I just, well, if I flew from Providence, because um, I'm in Rhode Island, if I flew from Providence, I do. So if I fly from Boston, it's direct, but then I have to go to Boston, which is an hour, um, which is what I'm going to do, because I'd rather fly direct. When I'm, like, traveling with books, I try to fly direct. Um, so, yeah, the one in Boston is Sinners and I want to say Sinners and Stardust, but I could be wrong. Um, and that is August 16th through the 18th. Uh, just to plug this, I have no connection to this group at all, but on FB, there is a group called Author Events Around the World. They have a spreadsheet that has every book event you could possibly imagine. It has the dates, it has the links where you can go and find their website, so if you want to know about book events go join this group because that is the that's the most comprehensive place i have found on the internet for all book events i actually never find out about them until like 
they're happening in three months and then people tell me and they're like you should go to this and I'm like well it's full and then I'll like randomly get a um email from like the event planners being like hey we have a spot and I'm like cool I'll come but I find out about them like very late yeah um Chris the one in Nashville it's mid-July I think it's like July 11th July like 11th through the 13th yeah because I, I've seen some authors, but I have asked, I'm like, are there going to be any narrators there? So yeah. they said there were, but they have not listed any yet. So Chris. Yeah, I, don't, I think they're just starting to announce the authors. So um, yes, Irish is on KU. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's, I mean, I, I always like getting in at the ground floor at some of these events because it's nice to meet people. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, it's nice when it's a smaller event sometimes because those big ones can be very overwhelming. They can. And I went to so many this year. It was so interesting to see the different vibes that each of those events had, which ones you felt like you could relax a little bit and you could sit there and you could talk to the author versus the ones that you could maybe see more people, but it was just like this, you know, you had yeah. to get in, you got your photo, you said hi, and then you had to move because there was a line of 50 people trying to get to see that author. So yeah, Love in Vegas was very overwhelming, um, for sure with how it was, it big was it was. Cool. And it was, I mean, it's also like the location, you know, because, and we were all just, you know, we, we all had our friends, so we were excited to see everybody. Yeah, readers take Denver. I'm, I'm wondering how that's going to be set up because that is a huge event. They did good last year setting it up. They really did a very good job. I'm very interested to see how that works this year. There's a lot a more. Venue. Totally different venue and a lot more authors. I think there's 400 um, vendors between authors, narrators, um, vendors, and uh, publishing houses are going to be there as well. So it's going to be... It's going to be overwhelming for sure. Very, very good. Yes. Sarah, Sarah is excited to have you there to help. Oh, I'm so excited to be there. I, I mean, I've gone to enough events now and since I'm mostly audio, I don't have a huge stack of books to go and have authors sign. I mean, I usually have a few and I usually just want to go say hi to my author friends. Yeah. But I would much rather feel helpful at those events. So I'm always looking and sending messages like, hey, author friends, if you need help at this event, let me know. Because I would much rather, you yes. know, be doing something like that and feel like I'm helping to support them than. Well, I might, know. if you are potentially coming to Vegas, I need to talk to you after. I am potentially coming to Vegas. <laughs> I'll talk to you later about that. Okay. Um, fun times. Yeah, I want to go to Wild and Winnie. I really want to go to. Chicago because I've never been. That was a fun event this year. I really enjoyed Chicago. I heard it was really great. So hopefully, what does an audio script format look like? Um, so we, I normally send them already highlighted. So I have somebody go in and highlight the female voices in a male chapter so that the female, like the female knows to grab those lines because we do it in duet. Um, but it normally is just a PDF of the book. It's not like, a, you know, it's not a true script. It's just the book because they have to read the book. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that when uh, when it gets to them, they have a lot of notes and things that they add to it. But from where it comes from me, it's just a highlighted version of the manuscript. Well, whoever is at Vegas, we might need you. I've got got something that I've got in the works, so a little exciting. Oh, oh! I wish I had thought to. I haven't read that part, but I've seen a couple of videos about it to ask. No, him. and I mean, I'm guessing that he knows it now because it seems as if he's he doesn't like to give those moments away, though. Yeah, that's true. He that would feel like a spoiler. Um, so I have a feeling that, um, but no, I did not give him a heads up. I did not at all give him a heads up about that. Um, did he say anything about it? No. And I almost wanted to say to him and like, I wanted to send a note to the production company to be like, could somebody like, please video them. 
<laughs> for this chapter because I really would love to see their reaction. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. The questions were just going so quickly. Um, yeah, I, I would, uh, love to see him read that. I don't think he's, um, I don't think that they've done voice the entire thing yet, but I'm not sure. But yes, I, I wrote, I mean, I, I wrote that. I think once again, I think I knew Joe was narrating that when I wrote that. Yeah. I'm I mean, sure. I, <laughs> that would be, that's like, Important I'm part. trying to think of when I figured out when I Mother Faker is the book we're talking about. Yeah, because I knew he was narrating it, I want to say, when I found out he was narrating Irish. I think I had already I said like both of them. I think I because I think I set them up at the same time. And so I hadn't written that yet from what I if I can remember properly. Because I I feel like I would have felt weird giving that to another narrator to do. So I definitely I really had to have known. It must have. But that will be fun hearing that part narrated in the book. Oh yeah. Would you ever give narrating one of your books a try? Um, no. <laughs> Just I don't have the software or um I used to think I actually did voiceovers um at, in high school uh, for toys. So I did that, but not for an entire book. I did not know that you did that. I did, I did. Um I did uh, voiceovers. I'm, my voice is on some toys. <laughs> it is. That's so fun. Yeah. You and I was, I did do acting growing up. So, I mean, I'm not unfamiliar with that, but. So I, I also had a little stint with acting, which is so funny because when people ask me now about narration, I say, I am not an actor because I'm not an actor. But when I was in middle school, I did get into acting and went, I had an agent and went to some open calls and some auditions. And I got so close to two movie roles where it came down to me and the person who actually ended up getting the part both times. So this was, um, so this was the nineties. Yeah. <laughs> so if you remember the movie, The War, uh, had Kevin Costner and Elijah Wood, and I don't remember what the female actor I feel like the person that took my part. <laughs> part. It was between me and her. I got to um, like do all of the things. Shut up. And then the next one was the Babysitters Club. Ah. Oh. And that came for the part of Christy, like the main character. Oh. And it was between me and the girl who got the part. They actually flew me to LA. I met with the director. I met oh. with the producers. I had to do a live audition. I was in the seventh or eighth grade when that happened. I think you would have made a better one. <laughs> well, thanks. My life could have taken a totally different turn had I gotten yeah. that movie role. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was the story was that the director really wanted me, but Columbia Pictures, they were friends with Sissy Spacek, who was also an actor, and it was her daughter. Uh-huh. So her daughter got, got the role, it. and I didn't. That was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane, first time I ever rode in a limousine. Like, it was, they picked me up from the airport, and it was quite the experience. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. yeah. But that was, that was the extent, I mean, a few commercials, and then I just kind of, I don't want to say outgrew it, but I just, I lost interest in it after that. Yeah, no, well, that's cool, though. Yeah, it was a fun experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I'll fill you in on the story later. <laughs> just me and my brief stint with acting as a child. Did you audition for 42? What's that? Oh, I was an extra in uh, Wait With Me, oh. the movie, the passion flicks. Yes, 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 yes. I did do that. Yes. That was... Awesome. Well, Brittany, I'm very excited about the end of the month. And our... Me too. I cannot so... wait. We're so close now. Two weeks away. It's going to be amazing. I hope we have good weather. Um, it's like a warm front that comes through. <laughs> I know, I know. But either way, it's going to be so fun and just a nice weekend of celebrating uh, the books and um, friendship and all of that stuff. So I'm excited for that. I can't wait. It's going to be super fun. I can't wait. 
I can't wait. I think this uh, MomCom series that you have is going to be very popular. I think Thank people you. are going to be very, very excited. And they're that just going to love it. They're going to have a good time. They're going to laugh. And I think that's what, especially this time of year. I mean, I know it probably wasn't that intentional the way that you planned it out, but coming off of the holidays this time of year, people are just, you know, people get down and nice cranky to have, and yes. you know, to, have, to have something to look forward to that we can laugh about and to have the books being released a week apart and then the audiobooks being released a week apart so you don't have to wait for it. You can get invested and you can just enjoy them. Yes, 1000%. Yeah, no, I'm excited. Um, the end of the month, we are going to Florida for a release party for MomCom. So the people that have helped us kind of launch this series and helped us um, put it together. And, you know, uh, Tiffany helped uh, us cast narrators and has kind of been along the ride for the whole thing. <laughs> um, uh, they're coming with us and we're excited to go and just relax on the beach and celebrate um, the mom comes. Yep. Yes. Sit in the hot tub. <laughs> really all I care about is sitting in the hot tub. <laughs> no children around. No children. I don't have to cook anybody's dinner. I don't have to drive anybody to activities. I'm going to leave Justin with a list and say. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it'll be super fun just to go and relax um, and just have some. <laughs> Ford will be there. <laughs> Ford will be there, I wish. <laughs> I wish, yeah. We didn't know what to do if Ford walked in. <laughs> Let's no. be oh, for the hot tub. Hot tub. It took me a minute too. Does it, I wonder if anyone has a white a white bikini. White. <laughs> oh. I don't own one of those. I'm, I'm kind of famous. Like every book I write has the friggin' hot tub in it. So I mean, you could have you could take your pick of which man you want the hot tub with. <laughs> the only one that doesn't is. Um, Irish because you know they're in a different they're in a different setting it's true there's a oh yes the hot tub with uh Jay and Kat <laughs> wow yeah Sarah wants Jay I'm gonna have to fight Sarah for Jay <laughs> Jay is I know I, know I, I said I said Joe is going I knew exactly who Joe was gonna pick knew it oh, knew okay. it I did Joe is always connected with cash since day one, yep, yep. which is why he made the perfect cash. Yeah, he was a great cash. Yeah. And playing that game, kiss, uh, Mary unalive. Um, I don't want to unalive him, oh, I know. but <laughs> you had to choose the way he handles certain issues at the end of whiskey lies. I was a little frustrated with him yeah. and his maturity. Quite, quite frustrated. Um, Irish can be read as a standalone. It is, um, he is a side character in the Whiskey Lies and um, Extra Dirty Duet. But I feel like you understand the series better if you obviously read those, um, but you could absolutely read him alone. Yeah, you will not regret the decision if you start with Whiskey Lies. <laughs> I'll just put right it that way. And you get duet narration with Joe and then I, excellent, excellent duet narration with these females. They're incredible. Incredible. You can't go wrong. You really I mean, can't. Brittany is the prime example of why <laughs> being so narrator motivated with audio. So way back in the summer when Whiskey Lies first came out, I heard about it. I knew that it was Lucy and Joe. I heard clips. It was like catnip. I had to listen to it. And of course, I absolutely loved it, devoured it. And from that, I had never read anything else by Brittany and Brittany has become a really good friend. Mm -hmm. So you just never know what yeah. can happen because you pick up an audiobook and you say, oh, I love those narrators. I'm gonna enjoy this. I don't really know what the story's about, but I don't really care because I know I'm gonna have a good time. And I think that's what's so amazing about really good narration. Oh my gosh, yeah. And it was so funny because I remember the first time I talked to Joe, he had said to me, you know, he was explaining to me the difference between duet and duel. And I was like, Whiskey Lies has to be duet. And he's like, I mean, I don't know if that's like, 
necessary. Like it, you can, you can want it and we can do it, but like, it doesn't have to be. And I was like, no, but it has to be. And the minute he finished recording it and he like sent it to production and he, he called me up on the phone and he was like, I just want to tell you best decision you ever made was duet narration on this. He's like, it's incredible. And I was like, thank you, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> I just pat myself on the back. He's like, people are going to go berserk for this. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I wonder and if it was that book that was a big, I mean, he might say different, but like a kind of a turning point for him because, I mean, he likes, he's always liked duet narration, but he also really likes the really idea like, of duel. Well, yeah. And that he did, yeah, he did start doing a lot more duet after that. Yes. He's done a lot of duet in the second half of last year, a yeah. lot more. But I also don't know if that's just because that's what authors are requesting. And I feel like listeners, especially newer listeners, that's what they want. Like they get used to it, they hear it, you know. Oh, no, what was know. your first ever audiobook? What a great one to start with. <laughs> right? I was just going to say, my goodness. I had a lot of people say that to me, though, because I feel like a lot of people um, that found my TikToks and Reels had never either read a romance book or had listened to an audiobook. So I had a oh. lot of people that were like first time romance people just because of the fact that the Reels went like viral. Um, so I had a lot of people that were not readers um oh that's fantastic though yeah no it was fun it, it was fun and like some of them are like now huge in the in the uh romance community so it, it the, and they'll say like but my first one was whiskey lies and i'm like that's so crazy that like you've gone from like zero to 60. um and now they're reading like all the dark romance and like everything but like they went from like oh my gosh what is this like right. six on a page like what <laughs> yeah good times yeah. I mean, because this, I mean, the spicy stuff is so fun to listen to, but I mean, and, and I talk about it a lot in my videos, but I also really try to highlight the deeper themes in the story yeah. because yeah. just me personally, I love the spice. I want some spice, but whether it's like low end or like high end, I want more meat to the story too. I want the That's human not. connection. I want the romance. I want the love story and the angst and the drama and watching two people have to work through really hard issues, whatever it is. And then they get their happy ending. Like I want to, yeah. I want to see that. So I always, even if I highlight some of the spice, I always really try to take time to highlight you know, a sound clip that's just really funny or a sound clip like the one I did for Irish Re uh, just in the yeah. last couple of days oh, you know, where Maxine, the, oh. Maxine sounds like she's sobbing and she was like, oh, I, I never beauty. thought that oh. she would be loved. And I just thought yeah. that's so relatable for so many people. And I just feel like that's important to highlight in romance as well, because I think the stigma that a lot of people have that it's just corn for women and right. like, yeah so much more than that it's it is. so much more than that and it is part of what i really want to help share with people i agree i mean some of my favorite parts are when it's like the female friendships or the male friendships like watching the banter in those scenes like oh. i really enjoy that um on top of obviously the, the the falling in love stuff i agree the friendships mean a lot to me and I was thinking about it today because I just finished listening to a book and I feel like um, it was uh, Harlow James, Never yeah, yeah. Say Never. And that book comes out on Monday. And there's a lot of themes in there specifically that deal with um, just women's roles in society and the roles that we step into naturally that we kind of get stuck in. So the book really addresses that. It addresses um, toxic family dynamics mm -hmm. and toxic parents and what that feels like for the main characters having to deal with that and then eventually coming to a place where they can set a boundary and i feel like romance is so important because we as readers and listeners if we are struggling with something that is similar and then we see that situation played out in a romance multiple times it gives us courage it helps show yeah. us like okay 
I can have that conversation with yes. my mother about X, Y, and Z, whatever it is, or I should have that really hard conversation with this person. Yeah. Because even though it's fantasy and it's fake and yeah. it's fiction, when you see how it can be done positively, yes. um, I just feel like that it really helps people in real life. I think also just seeing how it, it's okay to walk away from toxic relationships. It's okay um, to look at the relationships that are around you and expect more from people. It's also okay to be so overwhelmed that you can't be the same, like someone for everyone. Um, right. You know, all of those things you can, you see like in um, romance because so much of it is dictated by, we're writing about our own experiences to an extent. I mean, when you write a reverse harem, I don't, but you, you know, like obviously that part isn't, you know, what a lot of us are experiencing, but the moments in them, you know, obviously come from somewhere. Um, and so, you know, that I always think is a good book will give you that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Books that you read that could have saved you years of therapy. Yeah. I think yeah. sometimes books can be therapy. Especially if you're reading something and then you're processing it with somebody else and helping you think about your own life and what you can control in your own life, what you can't control in your own life. And do you okay. often buddy read um, or buddy listen? I wouldn't say often, but I just started one because um, my audiobook club this month has um, Carla Sorensen, The Best Laid Plans. It's a Kindle Unlimited read and listen for free. Oh. And so I started listening to that audiobook with two of my best friends who live here, um, who aren't nice. like on social yeah. media or anything. So we're yeah. doing a buddy listen. So we're able to talk about it. And then I'm doing one with Sarah, Cassandra and Kiera at the beginning of February, um, just for fun. It was a book that right. I've been told about. And so we're just gonna listen to it and talk about it and love it. But yeah, I love that. I love being able to talk about some of those things and share the same experiences. I mean, that's why right. that's why book talk and bookstagram is yes. addicting. I mean, really, it's addicting, right? Because you get so excited about the thing you're reading or experiencing, and you just need to be with other people who want to yes. the same and understand it. Yeah, one thousand percent. Because you can't turn to like your spouse that's next to you that's not reading it and be like, "Oh my gosh, can you believe this just happened?" Can you believe he sent her a song every day? I know. And Justin, like my sweet husband, he is so supportive. But at the same time, like he doesn't really care about a lot. Like he doesn't care. No. He reads fantasy, like actual fantasy books. Like he wants yeah. to read about dragons and, yeah. you know, all of those things. He doesn't really care about the romance part of it. I'm like, but then this happened. He said, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes, book oh. friends. That's what the internet is for. Lots yeah, of, plenty almost, of book all friends. All of my book friends are online. Yeah. Two book friends in real life. And one of them, she doesn't listen to a lot of the same things I listen to. The other one does. She listens to all the same stuff. She's just, she'll just tell me. She was like, okay, which uh, Jacob Morgan book do I need to do next? <laughs> She's I love it. Jacob Morgan fan, so. I love him. He's very swoony. He's, he can, there is something about the tone of his voice. I don't yeah. know what kind of witchcraft it is, but just, I don't know. I don't understand. <laughs> okay, just finished Whiskey Lies. Any favorites you can recommend? Well, then you have to do Loving Whiskey. Did you stop thinking, the Whiskey you Lies? Couldn't get, you couldn't get you stuck on that whiskey one. Lies. <laughs> Um, oh, Nikki, you got him to read one? So sweet. I'm so glad that he did that. Thank you. I mean, there have been a few that I feel like Justin would actually enjoy or he would think is funny. But it's kind of like he wants me to listen to some of his fantasy books. I have no like, I don't want desire. to. Right. Like, I don't. These are made up places with made up names with rules and magic that I don't understand. I don't care. And it's it's how long is that audiobook? that it's 32 hours long? Absolutely not. Do you know how many romance books I could listen to in that length of time? So I get it. I can't make him do it if I'm not. No. Yes. 
Oh. Very sweet. Um, D Mate 44 says a majority of her book quotes in her book club are from your books. Are you the one that was emailing me yesterday? Somebody said the same thing to me yesterday and she sent me the lines. Um, oh, I love that. No, I love it. How special is that as an author to hear just like words that came out of your head and how much it can impact people's lives. I love it. I do. I do. I love it. And I'm, I thought I had guessed it was one line and I was wrong. Yes, you were. Yes. Um, she had said to me, it was, uh, there was a line from Irish and I of course thought it was the one where the husband is bleeding out, um, line. Cause everybody always says that one to me and no, it was fight sleep with me, baby. And I was like, Oh, I used that one in my audio, my clip yes, online. Did. And that's what I said. I was like, somebody just used that. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah. Yep. Sleep with me, baby. Oh, I love that part. I know. So cute. I just thought that was such a sweet. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do a, a spicy moment for this. Like this was so, mm, I loved it so much. They were very, they were very mushy. I liked them with all of their emotions. They were good. All right, well, it is 11 o'clock here, so I am going to go to bed. Same. We have to get up very early in the morning, so. Mm -hmm. Well, you go take some Advil. Yes, I don't have a headache. Water. And drink some more water. I mean, really, this is it. This is the only, only thing I've had, but, man, I don't know if it's my age or what the deal is. But it, it hits it's that me. strong drink. So it was a strong drink. It was delicious. Right. I, I still feel pretty good. Not gonna lie. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, well thank you, good. Tiffany. I appreciate awesome. you. Love you. I'm excited love you. I will see you soon. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out with us tonight. Go good get night. Bye. Bye.